Good evening, everyone. I am Iris Bonet. I'm the academic dean here at Harvard Kennedy School. It is my distinct honor to welcome all of you to a very special evening here tonight where we will have Professor David Gergen of the Harvard Kennedy School in discussion with our guest of honor, Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. They will talk about a small topic, namely how to improve the state of the world. <laughs> Before I begin, let me also thank those who have made this event possible here, the Institute of Politics, the Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School, and the Office of the Provost at Harvard University. I'd also like to express my thanks to three particular individuals, individuals Dean Elwood, David Gergen, and Paul Smike of the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much. The Kennedy School has and has had for a long time very close ties with the World Economic Forum and we're very proud of this partnership. In fact, let me also welcome another group which is here tonight, the young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. They're here for an executive program on global leadership and public policy for the 21st century, a program that I'm the faculty chair of. These are a group of incredible young leaders, young leaders under 40, selected by the World Economic Forum for their accomplishments in life, but maybe even more importantly, for their contributions in the future to make the world a better place. With that, let me introduce David Gergen. David Gergen is a professor of public service here at the Kennedy School and also the co-director of our Center for Public Leadership. David is also a senior political analyst for CNN and has served as an advisor in four different White, House, White Houses to four different presidents of both parties, something almost unimaginable today, <laughs> sadly enough. David is a wonderful colleague here at the Kennedy School and inspiration to our students here and on TV and on the many non-for-profit uh, boards that he serves. He serves for Teach of America and many, many others, City Year, many others. He's also the recipient of 24 honorary degrees. We're delighted to have both of you here tonight and I'll turn over to David to introduce our guest of honor, Klaus Schwab. Thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you, Eris. <laughs> And, and please know that Iris has been the faculty leader of the Young Global Leaders Program here for the last several years and has made it a splendid success. We owe a great deal to you, Iris, for the work that you've done. Thank you very, very much. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Klaus, we might, I just, uh, you've done, you've built this Young Global Leaders Program. You wanted to bring it here to the Kennedy School. Are there what young global leaders who are here? Could you please stand just for a moment and we could celebrate you? Please, thank you. <laughs> and Klaus, we can't say, how great, uh, say enough how grateful we are uh, for the leadership that you have shown, uh, for the uh, inclusion of so many from Harvard. There are many Harvard faculty members uh, here tonight who have been to Davos, they've loved it, uh, they want to come back. They, uh, but they, uh, it has been a, a wonderful experience and I think the relationship, the partnership you've developed with the universities across the world is one of the remarkable aspects of the World Economic Forum. Uh, I am, rather than talking about your biography, uh, what I'd like to do is ask you, <laughs> if I might, about your journey. Uh, because I think so many are curious who is this man who has built this extraordinary organization uh, out of thin air, created mm -hmm. something that now has enormous influence around the world? So let's start. You, you were born of German parents, but you grew up mostly in Switzerland. Just see your other way around. Uh, you were born of Swiss parents and German. Exactly, German. exactly. And, um, but before uh, answering to your question, yeah. let me just um, uh, add my own thanks uh, 
to uh, also sitting here um, with whom we have cultivated over years such a strong cooperation. Here is um, uh, David um, and so on. I could mention so many people here who have been mentors um, from the early times on um, and who have uh, really made a great contribution to the development of the World Economic Forum. So a very cordial thank you. But coming back to your question, um, my uh, parents originally came from Switzerland, uh, but I grew up in Germany and I was born uh, just before the war. And I was quite lucky because um, uh, I was not directly affected by the war, but what le left a great impression on me was the fact that uh, I um, lived through some bombardments. I went to school when most of my, um, uh, uh, most of the other um, um, people in the school had lost parents and so on. Uh, so my first important step in my journey was that I, after the war, when everybody had lost its national identity, particularly a German identity, um, I um, uh, got engaged very much in the German-French youth movement, which was very essential. And I actually chaired this movement for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And then I did my studies in Switzerland and became an engineer, mechanical engineer. Um, I added a PhD, I first had a PhD in mechanical engineering and afterwards one in economics. And and then I after that, why, what brought you to the Kennedy School? What brought you to Cambridge? Ah. Uh, I don't know whether, well, if you want to hear it, but yes, uh, we do. I think we're very curious. But um, I felt uh, in order to be a successful um, person, I have to go to a business school. So I applied to Harvard Business School and um, got accepted. And then I felt having already two PhDs, I don't have to go and to do two classes in two years. So I, I wrote to the school across the river, and they said, no, no way. And then I found out that there was a kind of literature center at the time, which was a, a predecessor of uh, the Kennedy School. And uh, at that time, you didn't have internet. There was a, a big book, and I read a, f a sentence, if you are registered and accepted at the literature center, you can cross-register wherever you want to <laughs> in the Harvard system. So I said, Great, I go for one year to the <laughs> Tower Center and cross-register for the second year at uh, the um, business school. And that's what I did. But then when I was here at the Tower Center in, in uh, 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 at the square, Howard Square, um, I became so interested. It was really for me a uh, life-changing experience because I felt um, I should devote my, my life not uh, to business, uh, despite the fact that I had all the necessary ingredients. Uh, I should uh, devote my life uh, to public service. Mm -hmm. And I started to write a book, um, or I wrote a book on um, modern management in the machine building industry as a me mechanical engineer. And I described probably for the first time what is called the stakeholder theory which means that business should not only serve uh, shareholders, but all stakeholders, employees, the government, and so on. And then I felt, uh, why not to create um, um, a platform where business leaders could meet their stakeholders? And that was the beginning of, uh, the, uh, of, of what we call Davos. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I wanted to do it only once for fun. In, in the meantime, I had been appointed professor in Geneva for business strategy. And I wanted to do it for fun once, but suddenly it became such a success. So um, I never would have thought uh, how it develops and so on. And may I just add one thing? At the beginning, uh, the stakeholder theory meant the business has to serve its stakeholders, all its stakeholders, not just shareholders. 
Today, the stakeholder theory for the forum means something else. It means, in addition, that business in itself is a stakeholder of our global future. And business together with governments, with, um, of course, civil society, and for us, very important, the young generation, have to work together to meet all the challenges which we have in the world. Because neither governments, nor business, nor civil society alone can address those issues. And I think that's the basis for the success of the forum, because we have become probably the most important, most influential, multi-stakeholder organization in the world. Let me go back to the time you said when you came here, it transformed your life. Was there a course, a professor, who really made that difference for you? Yes, uh, there was um, one course, one seminar of um, Henry Kissinger, uh, which really opened my eyes. I wasn't accepted to the seminar, but I sat in. I think he let me in because I was German. and. Uh, and it was relatively shortly after the war, there were not too many Germans here. And uh, this created a friendship which has um, uh, endured until today. And uh, you know, uh, Henry has been several times in, in Davos. Um, and I think it was mainly uh, participating in his seminars that I developed my interest for geopolitical affairs. Mm -hmm. And you, over time, then, you got to know Joe and I, and I know Graham became exactly. a close friend as exactly. well. Exactly. I see. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, son, I, uh, Joe and I, um, who, who was a mentor, um, you, Graham, um, and um, I would say um, certainly about 10%, if I look at all the, the people who contributed uh, uh, intellectually in Davos, I would say um, the Kennedy School and, and Harvard was always the most important uh, uh, factor in that. Well, well we're, we, we're delighted to have you back now. So by 27, you had five degrees. You had five university degrees by the age of 27. That's right. And uh, in, a, in my modest way, I would say uh, most with summa cum laude. Uh, <laughs> in your modest way. <laughs> All right, and, by, and then you became the youngest professor in Switzerland, and at 31, you started the organization that became the World Economic Forum, at the age of 31. Yes, and I started it. It's, it's also interesting. Um, I, I have to add here a story. I, um, uh, because it was a temptation to go back to business, um, I, in order to finance the first um, meeting. Uh, it was an entrepreneurial um, activity. Um, I, I needed some money and my, my parents uh, felt um, uh, I should rather, uh, I mean this conference, what, what does it mean and so on. Uh, you, you have such a great education, you should go into business. And my father himself was a business leader. So um, I um, needed some money and I met at, um, uh, some, uh, at that time I, I was a keen uh, golf player with a handicap of four. So I was uh, taking part in, you remember. A, in a tournament. Yeah. I haven't played golf anymore since 35 years. So I was taking part in a tournament and I met a German um, industrialist, uh, the biggest upholstery company in the world. And um, he had a son, and they didn't go along very well. So um, I felt he's, he, he has some money. So um, I asked him whether he would give me a credit, and he said, uh, I explained to him what I'm doing, and he said yes, but um, if you lose some money, which he assumed, you come back and you work in my top management um, for at least three years. And I remember how happy I was when, when um, the first meeting had ended. Uh, we had a surplus, which just allowed me to, um, uh, to pay him back. And on the other hand, 
according to Swiss law, you needed 50,000 Swiss francs to create the foundation. So I just had 49,000 Swiss francs left. I, I added the 1,000 which were missing, and I created the foundation because I didn't want uh, to, to run this as a commercial event. Uh, so the foundation, it, it, it's uh, quite interesting. I took the risk, but the foundation uh, created itself practically mm -hmm. through the income of its first activity. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. I, I, and, and trying to explain how the, uh, uh, your effort took off, the whole organization took off, I did notice, and I wondered, is it any coincidence that the year you formed the organization is also the year you got married? Uh, uh, yes, because um, at the time... Did that have something to do with the success of the organization? No, at the time I was a professor, I didn't know a lot about how to organize a conference. So I, I, I made an ad in the leading Swiss paper saying I look for, uh, uh, for, an, uh, for, for a woman or a man but, um, with conference experience. And I got an application from a young woman who said, I speak four languages. Uh, I have, I'm working with the European Farmers Organization and I have organized uh, conferences for um, farmers and so on. And I said, there's not a lot of difference between farmers, uh, farmers and global leaders. <laughs> so, so I hired her and uh, yeah. of course she became my wife. So that's the, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's the, you see, you see the force of complementary interests <laughs> and capabilities. So you got the organizational capacity through. Exactly, wow. exactly. All right, so we now, now we know. And so here's this organization that has grown to this mammoth uh, uh, force and has enormous influence dedicated to improving the state of the world. What is the state of the world today as you see? I would say first, you could be relatively pessimistic when you look uh, at all the issues we have to deal with simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, I have the feeling the change is so fast that we have lost the capacity to deal with the change. And in addition, having the crisis um, and coming out of the crisis, uh, we are much too much backwards oriented or crisis management oriented and do not have a time left really to, to shape our future. That's maybe where the forum is coming in. So you could be pessimistic, but um, when you look back, and I just take the year 71 when the World Economic Forum was created, and just think for a moment, uh, we had, at that time, we had four billion people. Today, a little bit more. Today, we have a little bit more than seven billion people. And at that time, we had two billion who were living, um, let's say, in poverty, however you define it, according to UN standards and so on. Today, you still have two billion people around living in poverty. So you could say, what shame, we haven't made progress. But actually, we integrated about three billion people into, uh, we made some global consumers, we gave some uh, uh, jobs and so on. So economically, uh, we have done, uh, we, uh, it, it, we, uh, there was great progress made. If you look politically in 71, most of the countries were dictatorships. The whole of uh, South Africa, uh, South, South America, even in Europe, I remember um, uh, Spain, uh, Greece, and so on. So if you compare it today, I mean, the, the degree of freedom you have despite uh, the, the countries um, we know of, um, I think uh, humankind in those uh, 40 years has made economically and politically progress. Uh, um, and we, we can be proud of those achievements. So if I take a, a, a view of the state of the world at the moment, I would be more, I would be very concerned. If 
I look at the progress which has been made. Mm. I believe in human nature to overcome those uh, challenges, particularly through collaboration and um, to continue uh, as a way of progress. So am I right to interpret that as say, you saying, if I just could only could look ahead, I would be pessimistic, but because I can look back and see how much progress, that gives me encouragement, despite what I see out in front of us. Yeah, yeah. So, and you have written that economically, we're, go we're going through epic transitions. You've written both economically, politically, ecologically, uh, and you've written that we're coming into an age of economically of lower expectations, uh, slower growth, uh, and rising inequality. We, we the forum is doing uh, research work whereby I have to stress whatever we do is always based on a networked approach. So we we publish, for example, a risk report which is the result of cooperation with hundreds of experts in the field. And um, uh, here, um, the lack of social inclusion uh, is one of the uh, top three risks. Now, um, I also feel, when, when you look at the present economic situation, um, I would analyze it in the following way. We are coming out of um, the recession slowly, but we have the tapering, we still have the debts in the government system or in Europe uh, to a large extent also in the banking system. We have what I would call the midlife crisis of um, emerging countries. Look at uh, China, but we, we see the reduction of growth in India and many other areas, Brazil. Um, so I would, I would say that the next um, years will be such reduced expectations, diminished expectations, that uh, contrary to the period before 2008, where we had about 5% global growth um, on an average, we probably will grow at around 3% growth over the next period, uh, maybe extended period. Yeah, compounded, that's quite Compounded. Now, when you look at the compounded effect, when you grow, when the economy grows with uh, 5%, you double GDP every 14 years, more or less. When you grow with 3%, you double GDP, global GDP, every 24 years. So this compounded, the effect is enormous. And of course it has consequences on job creation, on social inclusion. So I'm, I'm afraid uh, that uh, the question of getting jobs um, and, and um, uh, reducing the gap which we have socially um, will be the major issues to be addressed by politicians, but also by business leaders and by society as such. One of the consistent themes in your work has been that many of the changes coming have a bright side, but they also have dark si a dark side. Uh, technology, one of the debates at Davos this year was whether robots, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, all the rest, are going to produce a higher standard of living for some but cost the jobs of many others? I, w I would say this is now a general uh, fear because um, even if you look at the percentage of, um, uh, of uh, wage, wages, uh, um, uh, salaries uh, in, in, in GDP, uh, you have um, a, a trend uh, uh, downwards, which means um, uh, were jobs which, which were usually at the base of what we call in German the middle stand, the middle class, um, are more and more eliminated. Uh, but um, this has a number of consequences. Um, we, we, we lose also uh, here, if an economy wants to grow, it needs the necessary demand. And the demand has to come mainly from the middle class. Um, I see already, I mean, 
I take Geneva, for example. Um, uh, in Geneva, see all the magazines, for example, which which serve the middle class, middle um, uh, with with uh, let's say good products, um, but not luxury products, are disappearing. And what you have are those. Um, magazines with very cheap products from Asia, and then you have the luxury products. So this middle class issue um, and its societal consequences, its consequences on even on democracy, I think will be a major issue with us for the coming years. Do you think the elites are willing to, to do what's necessary to really close the gaps on inequality? You, you deal with the elites all over the world. I, I, I would say, uh, to a certain extent, if you look at the rise of philanthropy, of the notion of philanthropy, I mean, that's elites giving back to society. Mm -hmm. And I have a good example here in the room. Um, uh, elites giving back to society, uh, that's one way. But uh, you know that many countries now um, are looking again at um, using the tax systems um, mm -hmm. to, to, to create um, um, a better um, or to reduce this increased uh, gap mm -hmm. uh, between high uh, earners and low income earners. Mm -hmm. are, are you worried at, at, uh, at all about the populism that's arising in many countries as people are rising, uh, they're coming up in the streets because they have no chances in life. They're, they live with authoritarian governments, are held back, uh, and they're pounding on the door from one, one country after another. Yes, we see it in, in Europe. We see, I see it also in this country when, when I turn on television. I mean, um, uh, I would say populist arguments become. Um, uh, mainstream, become mainstream, and um, um, I, I feel um, probably based also on the crisis what we see, um, see, we develop a kind of banker mentality, which means, uh, which has two consequences. First, we don't want so many people don't want to hear anymore what's really going on in the world. You just look at your own interests. And second, you become more egoistic. And actually, if you, you look become more what? Egoistic, um, mm. selfish. Yep. And actually, if, if you look at our world of today, the so big challenge we have is uh, to develop different levels of identities. That's my, my concept. You need you need a, a local identity because you need your roots. You certainly have a national identity. In Europe, we even have a European identity. And finally, you need today, because we are in an interconnected global world, we need, in principle, a global identity. But instead of trying to accommodate those four different levels of identity mm -hmm. or three different levels of identity, people are now uh, again seduced um, to play out one identity against another one. I mean, we just um, went through a popular vote in Switzerland where, um, let's say, the key was uh, we don't want to have anything to do with those uh, Europeans. We want to be Swiss, and we want to preserve our Swiss identity. Um, so if we do not learn, and uh, I think this is particularly important for the young generation here, if we do not learn to accept that we have different identities uh, which we need to respond to different levels of challenges, uh, we, we will not uh, necessarily have a peaceful world because we will not be capable to address, without a global identity, we will not be capable to address those global issues and challenges. And do you think the younger generation needs to be a much more global generation? No, I think the older generation should be a much more uh, <laughs> uh, global generation uh -huh. because what, what is fascinating, we, we have here the Young Global Leaders, but the Forum has also developed a, a community of global shapers. 
leaders between 20 and uh, 30 years old, and we are now represented in 320 different cities. And when I'm traveling, I'm, I'm always meeting the shapers. Um, um, yesterday evening, for example, in, in Washington. And I'm always amazed. Uh, I would say everybody who, 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 who has a depression should go and have a meeting with the global shapers. <laughs> Much better than I, any psy psychiatrist and so on. Yeah. Um, because you, you, you come out, you believe again in, in, in life, you are optimistic, you are global, you are forward-looking. Um, um, so I, my, my, my hope is, um, or my, my intention, is to integrate much more the young generation into, into what we are doing. And that's what we are trying to do with the young global leaders and, and, and also with the global shapers. Hmm. In judging countries, I'm, I'd like to come back to that in a few moments. Yeah, you've written that in, uh, and, and judging countries' economic performance and where they're headed, it's much less important to, me to measure GDP than it is to measure the degree of innovation. That innovation is the driving force. How does one encourage that in societies? First, uh, just to come back to the basic argument, we, we, we went through several um, phases. We, we, did, we, we had um, uh, developed countries and developing countries, uh, but then we spoke about underdeveloped or uh, industrialized countries, we use emerging countries. I was in a commission of the UN which had to decide whether a country belongs, so was a more neutral language, low income, middle income or high income country. I think the future we will have a differentiation which will be very simple between high innovation com um, countries or even areas and low innovation countries because it will be innovation, creativity, which will become the driving factor. Um, the, the traditional competitive advantages like um, low cost, low labor cost and so on uh, will play less a role. Um, uh, just see the increase of labor costs now in China and so on. So the capability of a country to, to be innovative will determine its uh, economic success. Now, what does it need for, for um, uh, innovation? Of course, rule of law, um, an entrepreneurial spirit, an enabling environment. And um, that's why the I'm a big believer uh, in, in, in the capability of the US to preserve a certain superiority because it's a country which is the most, in, which offers the most enabling environment uh, for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What other countries would you put in the high innovation category? I, I would say Switzerland. Um, um, uh, certainly, and then you have to, it's probably less because it's the, it's the enabling environment which has to do uh, a lot, uh, not only with a with national uh, backbone, but with, with what's happening regionally. Mm -hmm. Look at the differentiation, uh, difference in, in the states between here and some other, um, let's say, uh, areas. In Europe, you find places like Berlin, you find places like Malmö, um, you in you find Israel um, and so on. So um, China and, and uh, Japan. Um, coming up, you find uh, in in China, of course, you have certain systems which are less uh, prone to to develop this this uh, or to provide this environment you, you need to succeed. And, and what is, I think, what is. Um, one of the main differences, if I look uh, uh, at, at Europe still and, and, and the United States, is when, when you create something as an entrepreneur in the States and you fail, okay, you have failed, you, you do it a second time. 
and uh, you are nearly a hero if you do it a second time. If, uh, if you fail in Europe, um, you are a failure. And, and you are regarded by society as a failure. Mm. So um, I think that's, um, that's, a big, that's a big difference. Mm. So for those who bet on China, could India well be the surprise? Um, given its innovative spirit? No, no, I, I find, I mean, again, looking at our uh, young global leaders in China, at our global shapers in China, you find, despite an environment which is not as enabling as uh, in the States, you find um, uh, people who have the will to succeed, who are entrepreneurial, because they want to show to society that they can succeed mm -hmm. and they want to succeed. Hmm. That's interesting. We're going to be coming to questions on the floor in just a few minutes shortly, uh, but we have a few other things I want to, if we could, get on the table. Uh, Robert Kagan, who, headed up your, who heads up the Global Council here for the United States, uh, recently wrote a, a, a long piece in the Politico magazine uh, and uh, talking about a survey of ver a variety of Davos participants and uh, talking, uh, concluding that we now have a double ambivalence in world affairs, geopolitical affairs, and that is the world is ambivalent about American power uh, and America has become ambivalent about using its power. Where do you, where, where, where do you think, where, from your perspective, watching the American uh, experience here recently, we've had, you know, we've, we've got a trade round that looks like it's going down. The president can't get his trade authority. Uh, he stayed out of a variety of things. Without getting into the politics of President Obama, I'm just curious whether you think that the United States is essentially withdrawing from the world stage more than it should. Uh, first, I I just happened to have breakfast with him this morning. And with the in president? Russia. No, not with, no, so he's still in Europe. <laughs> oh, with, uh, yeah, right. With Kagan. And with, with, uh, with oh, Kagan. Yeah, oh, sorry. Professor Kagan. And of course, we had an uh, interesting discussion on those issues. Yes, uh, I'm very curious those, about those that. issues. Um, f first of all, um, when, when we look, uh, I think there's now a, even a new situation with, which has developed with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you look how the world has uh, developed, you had the post-war uh, period, which was uh, mainly based on, on two powers, um, with one power, of course, uh, stronger, but there was some kind of uh, equilibrium. And then the, you had the, uh, uh, the uh, past Cold War period, uh, which uh, became more and more multilateral. The G20 was an expression of it. Um, but the US was still capable to shape to a certain extent the world order. Now, with what we have seen now in the, in, in the Crimea, um, um, I think the US has lost in this multilateral world really the capability to shape matters. It doesn't and have the capacity or doesn't have the will? I, I think it's, um, it's um, the capacity would be here, but it would be a high price to use this capacity because, uh, I mean, we, we um, but what, what, I, what I feel, we, we, we speak too much, if I look more at the future, um, we should not argue so much in national terms, US versus Europe. By the way, I was very encouraged by the speech of the president yesterday because uh, it showed uh, a, a willingness to assume global responsibilities again. But at the end, it's not a question of U US versus Europe or, or, or whatever it is. I think we all here in the room want to live in a world which is characterized by certain values. And maybe we are much too much used to those values like uh, the capability of free speech, human rights, uh, 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 
democracy, um, and so on and so on. Um, so instead of speaking about uh, US versus um, uh, Europe or whatever it is, um, we, we, should, we should go into the direction of a coalition of countries based on the same values. If we do not achieve such a situation, um, those values will be eroded. Um, and so it's not only, let's say, hostile forces in the world who want to erode this, this value. I think also internal forces, like the impact of technology, of the media on democracy, are also eroding those forces. So we should, we should create, again, a coalition to defend the fundamental values on which our societies is, uh, are based. Do you worry at all that we've become very good at, at giving voice to our values, but not very good at living up to our values? Uh, the, 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 we heard a very fine speech. We've heard very fine speeches from Western Europe, Western leaders about Ukraine, and yet the President's own former Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, uh, wrote yesterday that the Western response to the Crimea has been anemic, quote, anemic. Yeah. Do you worry about the gap between rhetoric and action? Yes, but you have to, uh, to, uh, to confront here uh, a situation where you're actually the price to act is so high so destructive, potentially, that um, even if you want to defend certain values, at the moment at least, uh, the uh, a rational approach dictates you that there are limits of what you can to do. And that brings me back to my, my original point. Um, the US has lost contrary uh, to what we have seen in the past. Uh, the capability to shape mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a substantial way what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. the except, except being the voice, maybe not the enactor, but the voice uh, for certain fundamental values which are dear mm -hmm. to probably to every American and to every European. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you have, uh, you, you come back regularly in your conversation and you've shown that in your own actions at, at Davos. You're placing an enormous amount of faith now and an enormous amount of your personal and, and, and emotional investment in the younger generation. It's really, really striking. You've got young global leaders, you've got the shapers, you've got the young global pioneers, you've got the social entrepreneurs through the Schwab Foundation and your wife Hilda. I'm, I'm just, you're, you're one of the leaders of the older generation that's really showing this is where we must have to put a lot of our bets. And I'm curious, you know, you've really focused on that. I'm curious why. Yes, uh, I mean, you just have to think about uh, the fact that the median age is 27 years in the world. And then you can go to some African countries where it's probably closer to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we all, have to, uh, the older generation, um, we in, in some way, we, uh, in, in what we are doing, uh, we have to take into account the interests, the expectations of the younger generation. And when you look what's happening at the world at the moment, we have a tendency to solve or to, maybe we have become so egoistic uh, and, and, and so spoiled in, in quotation marks that we, um, we have a tendency to, to solve the problems on really um, uh, at the disadvantage of the next generation. Look at our social security system. Look at um, probably how health uh, systems evolved. Um, uh, who will pay for it? The next generation. And. Um, we, we, we have the illusions that, yes, we have accumulated debts, which are now, uh, depending whether you look just the government or you include the social systems and so on, you speak about 100 to 300% of GDP, someone will have to pay for it. 
um, that do not go away. So um, are we ready, the older generations, to pay for it? Or do we just think, oh, let's leave it to the next generation? Um, and so I come back to my point. Uh, with a, with a um, economy which has a slow growth, um,